my name is Lee Robertson, and I'm the coordinator for the San Miguel Basin Guns and Sage Grass Working Group. And I'll be telling you a little bit about some of what we're, we've been doing since the last time we've gotten together at one of these summits. And I did want to dedicate this presentation to the memory of Jim Boyd. Uh, he's there on the left. He was a longtime member of our working group. We really appreciated all his input and help over the years. This last August, he was helping us put in Z-Dyke structures, and he did die this December. So this is in Jim's memory. start talking a little bit about some of the habitat improvement projects that we've done. And, you know, as I mentioned, this past August we did put in some Z-Dyke structures that was in Dry Creek Basin, which is southwest of Norwood, Colorado. We had um, Bill come out a couple years ago to look at some different sites with members of the working group and so we could try to figure out where we might want to put the structures and then we had a lot of partners help us bring Bill in to do a workshop for landowners and agency people. So we had one day inside learning about you know, the whys and where to put these structures and then the next day out in the field on some private land and it was on land that was protected by a candidate conservation agreement with assurances and we had a lot of fun putting in structures. And one thing that was kind of cool, we did also do some monitoring, photo points, transects, and some insect monitoring as well. And I went back five weeks later just to take a look, and we were already seeing quite, you know, a difference. So here's one of our One Rock dams, and then five weeks later, you can see we're already getting some sedimentation to try to bring the level of that incised channel back up closer to the historic floodplain and hopefully we'll eventually get some water back on the historic floodplain and improve the habitat. And then here's one that some members of our group were wondering, well, was this a good place to put one or not? Because we're kind of um, keeping some of those minerals maybe in one spot and, you know, Bill was saying, he's, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing. Did you want to Talk about that any, Bill? I mean, you, you shared some insights the other day with me, so I'll let you share that with the group. And when we do a question and answer, you know, or if people want to chime in, you can let me know what you think. This is almost entirely extemporaneous. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, it's obvious that we've got uh, uh, some of the um, alkali deposits in an area that had been wet and as it dried out, the alkali was deposited and we're concerned about that. But I've also seen places where the, the gully is much deeper and therefore drains the soil on either side of the gully seasonally and it's wet early in the spring or in snow melt or in the storm in the monsoon season. And so the alkali deposits are going to occur anyway, and if we get them wetter for longer periods of time than adapted um, grass species like our polysocotone or others might come back in and they actually end up better vegetated than they would have been. So I think we just have to live through the space and that was due for another layer of rock to be added already in the first season and gradually we would collect more soil more organic matter and seedbed for the appropriate uh, music and weapon species. So I, I, I think we should just bear with it. Yeah, we did um, put in some transects and photo points. This wasn't one of the spots where we put in a transect, but we will go back and take photo points and see how that changes over the years and decide if we think this one was a good idea or not. And another thing we did that I'm a little bit proud of is we decided to film Bill. Um, I looked online and there were some videos of Bill talking at conferences, but I didn't see any that really explained how to actually do the structures. And not everyone could come to the workshop and, you know, we thought it would be a good idea to get the information out there on how to actually build the structure. So um, we filmed Bill doing the One Rock Dam, the Rock Rundown, the Zuni Bowl and the Media Luna. And you can see those on our web 
website. If you go to sanmiguelgrouse.org, go to our news and data page, and then we've got information about, you know, the structures. You can click on link for the video. We have a link to the Gunnison Basin video about what's been done. Um, and you can also just go ahead and go to YouTube, put in Z Dyke Zuni Bowl or Z Dyke One Rock Dam, and they'll come up. They're relatively short, I think anywhere from about four to eight minutes. We just tried to get the most important points of how to build these structures. So, you know, please check them out and share the information with landowners and other folks who might be interested. And also, since we met last time, there's been some pinion junior per removal in Dry Creek Basin as well. You can see some before and after photos. And I did just want to mention, you know, I have talked with some folks um, since some presentations earlier about pinion junior for removal, and there is some concern about things like pinion jays if we're taking out pinion junipers. Um, we are trying to just take out the smaller PJ, younger, and, and not go for the older pinion juniper, but it is something to think about, you know, other species who rely on pinions and junipers. Okay, another um, stream restoration project that's been done, and Jim Garner was real active in this, was in Dry Creek. Um, it's a bigger creek than where we put some of the z structures last year. Um, it isn't quite as deeply incised here, but in some places it's incised like 20, 30 feet, and it really gets a lot of water moving through when there's some big rain events. And uh, Craig Sponholtz actually came out and um, suggested some spots to put in some structures. And you can see a lot of structures were put in. And, you know, Jim Garner, feel free to jump in if you want to add some information. And it was a little different than the rock structures. They um, dug some trenches, put in some cedar posts to try to divert water and actually have water erode the banks so we could get um, the banks more at an angle and maybe eventually you know, get some different deposition and grouse might actually be able to get down into that channel. And here's another type of structure that was put in, both rocks and the poles. And you can see the sedimentation. Willows were also planted, and that's probably a good thing because the soil in this area is very erodible, and so already some of those rock structures, you know, we're getting sediment up to the height of the rock structures, but hopefully the willows will expand and grow and also help in the deposition and um, re retention of sediment. Tamarisks were also removed as part of this project as well, and we did get help from Youth Conservation Corps crews. Okay, then we've also done a few things as far as habitat protection goes, and some I think it was pretty obvious that we did get some habitat preserved. Others, you know, maybe it didn't go quite as well as we hoped, but, you know, you also have some you win, some you lose, and some that are kind of in between. So one of the ones that didn't go quite as well as I would have liked is um, a gravel pit was proposed in occupied habitat as um, designated by Fish and Wildlife Service in the Sims Mesa population. And that's just um, southwest, or maybe south of Montrose there. And so from a grouse standpoint, a lot of us didn't really want a gravel pit to go into occupied habitat. And then it was a special use kind of um, situation. It was ag lands, and the gravel pit needed a permit from Montrose County to go in there. And really, the landowners did not want a gravel pit in that area either. A lot of homes were in that area, and they just didn't want gravel trucks going back and forth. And um, But the Montrose County commissioners did approve that. One good thing is, though, um, I think partly because of all the outcry from the citizens um, the folks who were proposing the gravel pit came up with a mitigation plan, and Steve and the folks at Biologic helped put that together, helped with that. So um, they did say they will be doing things to minimize the impacts on the grouse. They will restore the areas. They're just going to do um, 
parts of the pit at a time, and then once one section was done, they would restore that area. They would be using um, native seed, seed mixes approved by Colorado Parks and Wildlife to restore the area. And then also, um, they were supposed to contribute, we were talking about this, either 20 or $25,000 towards transaction costs for conservation easements in grass habitat. So um, Steve was saying, if you have any ideas for good places for conservation easements, let him know about that. Okay, another thing that's happened since the last summit is a candidate conservation with assurances did get put in in Dry Creek Basin, and it was over 15,000 acres on Raymond Snyder's land, so that was a good chunk of the habitat out there. And some other conservation easements have also gone in. Um, one of them that just happened recently was some more land was added to this Hughes property that's on Beaver Mesa. And here's Placerville, to give you an idea of where that is. Also in the west end of the county, um, in, in the Dove Creek area, we've got some things going on, and this is with um, Montezuma Land Conservancy. So 1,600 acres should get closed on in 2016. And then there's also some other easements that have gone in for a total of 4,641 acres protected in occupied habitat since 2012 in this area. And one thing I was really excited about is, um, you know, over the years we've been trying to protect land around Miramonte Reservoir. This is south of Norwood. And um, through the Colorado Wildlife Habitat Protection Program, we've got some land that was purchased um, that is now part of the Dan Noble State Wildlife Area. We've also um, got some conservation easements put in. This is on private land and some CCAAs. And um, there was this one chunk here that was an old Boy Scout camp um, that was for sale. It could have been split up into four parcels, and we really didn't want that to happen, and we we're trying to figure out ways to get that preserved. And San Miguel County stepped in and purchased that property, which is great. Not only because there is grouse habitat in the western part of this property, but also the access road was right through really prime grouse habitat. There were a lot of locations along this road. So if this had been purchased and developed, there could have been four families in there, you know, driving in and out on that road all the time, and it could have had some strong impacts to grouse. So um, we're really happy that San Miguel County purchased that property. And here's a look of what it looks like, so pretty good grass cover, sagebrush, and it's relatively close to a lake as well. And then also a little bit on population monitoring. You ever wonder what the grass think of those little things we put on them? <laughs> so here's what the San Miguel population has been doing since 2001. So in 2001, on the left-hand side, you can see we had a a pretty good estimated population, around 400 birds, and the target population was about 450. Um, you can see probably some effects from the drought around 2003, it dipped down, and it's done some up and down, and then the last few years it has been climbing back up. Okay, another thing that I'm hoping we'll talk about when we have the question and answer is the role of working groups. So I'll let you be thinking about that, formulating some questions for when we have our panel discussion. Because um, who knows what the future is going to bring. It'll be interesting to see what the 4D rule is like and um, how we might help in a recovery plan. And I do also want to thank everyone who's contributed funding to us over the years and all our partners, everyone who's been involved in all the efforts. And I see I have a little time, so I actually wanted to bring up something else that's somewhat unrelated, but um, when people were talking earlier, they were talking about how you need to have a common goal. And one thing I've learned through another position I have is sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what you want in habitat, but it can be easy to sometimes figure out what you don't want. Undesirable conditions, you know, for example, we know we don't want huge fires going through the sagebrush, so what can we do to prevent that? So just a little food for thought. 
sometimes it's easier to figure out the undesirable conditions and then go from there. Um, okay, I think that's it for my time.